He is the recipient of the American Lifetime Achievement Award. This cup was dedicated to him by the First World Congress of Logotherapy in San Diego. Among the many honors bestowed upon him is the Oscar Pfister Award of the American Psychiatric Association. And 21 honorary doctor degrees from universities all over the world. In these files in his flat, you can find all his publications since 1945, when he returned to his hometown Vienna after three years in German concentration camps. Viktor E. Frankl lived and worked in this house from the day of his birth on until the day of his deportation to the concentration camp. It's a rare occurrence for someone who's still living to be honored with such a memorial plaque. Frankl's former home in the Cherningasse, number six, is situated opposite the Viennese residence of Alfred Adler, the founder of individual psychology. According to the American Journal of Psychiatry, Frankl's work is, quote, perhaps the most significant thinking since Freud and Adler. The characteristical talent or ability to recognize the characteristic features of a person at first sight is certainly related to his talent for psychiatry. For the psychotherapist must also be able to immediately perceive the weaknesses of a patient. But he also has to find possibilities to help him overcome his weaknesses. This is one of Dr. Frankl's statements in one of his books, which he's autographing for our film team. Viktor Frankl, born in 1905 in Vienna, founder of the Third Viennese School of Psychotherapy. Professor Frankl, looking back on your life, how did you become the person you are today? Well, I may say that as a child of about three years of age, I already wished to become a medical doctor. And later on during puberty, in adolescence, better to say, I also was intrigued by philosophy, took an interest in philosophy. So it's understandable that psychiatry, but in particular psychotherapy, offered itself as some sort of a combination, fulfilling both the wishes of mine. And I may epitomize the whole story to make it short uh, by saying that I wanted to become a doctor. I became a doctor. Then I wanted to be a good doctor. I hope I was no bad doctor. But finally, I wanted to remain a human being in spite of all that. I still try. In 1946, Dr. Frankl became the head of the neurological department at the Vienna Polyclinic. Day for day for 25 years, he walked from his apartment in the Marianengasse to the polyclinic nearby. To become a doctor was the fulfillment of his professional wish since his earliest childhood. His father too had wanted to become a physician, but he had to discontinue his studies for financial reasons. Viktor Frankl's interest in both philosophy and medicine led him to view psychiatry as something like a synthesis of the two. Did you have any role models or people who influenced you in your way of thinking? Of course. The founders of the first two great schools of psychotherapy, that is psychoanalysis and individual psychology, or as it's sometimes called, referred to also Adlerian psychology. Uh, already as a high school uh, student, I started uh, exchanging letters with Sigmund Freud and he readily answered each letter that I had sent him and after I once uh, enclosed, enclosed to my letter a short statement about some ideas uh, uh, connected with psychoanalysis, 
he answered by uh, telling me that uh, he not only received my letter but also has already forwarded that manuscript as he referred it to uh, to the editor of the International Journal of Psychoanalysis and a few years later it was published there already 1924. Well, I also once uh, happened to meet Sigmund Freud in the vicinity of the University of Vienna. I uh, noticed a man who looked like Sigmund Freud, but I thought it cannot be Sigmund Freud from his whole appearance. And so I told myself, okay, let's follow him. If he makes a turn from the Weringerstrasse to the Berggasse, it must be Sigmund Freud. So I followed Freud. In other words, I became a follower of psychoanalysis of Sigmund Freud. I followed Freud and he did make the turn into Bergasse. So I uh, had courage enough to stop him on the street and introduce myself. Uh, have I the honor to speak to Professor Freud? Yes, that's me. Okay, my name is Viktor Frankl. Wait a minute, Viktor Frankl. Uh, uh, second district of Vienna, Chenin, Gasse number no. 6, apartment number no. 25. Correct? Yes, absolutely correct. He remembered the address from the exchanging of letters throughout a few years. And then I told him I've read a book on uh, the death, uh, death drive uh, in French, whether he's interested. He said, oh, I am very interested. Could you kindly uh, write an article and uh, send it to the editor of Imago, the second uh, psychoanalytic journal? And I promised it, but I didn't keep the promise because in the meantime, I was affiliated, became affiliated with this circle around Alfred Adler. And one year after the publication of the psychoanalytic article of mine, there was a real psychological, uh, psychological article of mine published in the International Journal of uh, Individual Psychology, uh, the Adlerian Psychology. But in uh, 27, I was upon the personal insistence of Alfred Adler expelled from the rows of the Adlerian society because I had become too much unorthodox. And thereupon, I started slowly to develop my own system, that is, logotherapy. In 1937, Frankl opened his private practice for neurology and psychiatry in Vienna, but was forced to close it after a short time. Some months later, Hitler's troops marched into Austria. And things changed. What were the consequences of the Anschluss in, in 1938 for you personally? Of course, from one day to the next, everything changed, both in professional as well as in personal and familiar uh, regards. Uh, I then was appointed the head of the Department of Neurology at the Jewish Hospital, the so-called Rothschild Hospital. But I could stay there and uh, keep my old parents from being deported until 1942 only. And then the three of us were deported to various concentration camps. My father died in Theresienstadt. My mother went uh, directly from the railway station of Auschwitz into a gas chamber. And myself, after entering Auschwitz, uh, had uh, a full-length book manuscript in my pocket, in the pocket of my overcoat, and everything was taken away, of course. But uh, after Auschwitz, I reconstructed the manuscript, and it became the book, that book which, uh, in English, published in the United States, uh, became, uh, got the title The Doctor and the Soul. Anyway, what my American publishers have sometimes stated on the back cover of my books is not correct. I did not 
come out, as they say, from Auschwitz with a brand new type of uh, psychotherapy, but I had entered it already with the respective manuscript. The reason for Viktor Frankl's survival in the concentration camp was most certainly related to his firm resolve to reconstruct the lost manuscript of his book. His parents and his brother died in Theresienstadt at Auschwitz, his first wife in Bergen-Belsen. This picture was painted by his cousin Otto Ungar when he was imprisoned in the Theresienstadt concentration camp. In the foreground, you can see a row of wooden coffins. In one of them, Frankl saw his father for the last time as a corpse. Doesn't every creator of a new system use his own case history as his basis? Certainly, you are right. And uh, I am not uh, an exemption from the rule in this respect. I certainly have uh, suffered uh, during my adolescence from uh, doubts regarding uh, whether life has a meaning or not at all. And so it's understandable that I slowly developed a theory, not to say a system, which is an affirmation, a strict affirmation of uh, the me potential meaningfulness of life. And uh, after I had developed this antidote, as it were, against the feeling of meaninglessness, it's also understandable that I try to offer it as an antidote, as a therapeutic system to other people. And since a feeling of meaninglessness forms and constitutes the real collective neurosis, the mass neurosis of our day, it's also understandable that ever more people are reaching out for a book which by its very title uh, seems to have to offer an answer to the question for, uh, of a meaning of life. And uh, uh, though it's also understandable that uh, the book Man's Search for Meaning, this was the very title, uh, has uh, so far lived up only, as far as its American edition is concerned, uh, to a selling figure of more than four million copies. Frankl's psychotherapy is often called height psychology in contrast to depth psychology. This is paralleled by his passion for mountain climbing, as well as by the fact that he learned to fly a plane at the age of 70. Your books have been translated into numerous languages and have found worldwide distribution. How do you account for their popularity? Uh, I would have to mention that in addition to my own books uh, and uh, their, uh, their translations, respectively, there have been 46 authors who have published their own books on logotherapy in uh, 14 different languages, and this has contributed to the worldwide uh, spreading of the message, so to speak, of logotherapy, with the uh, final effect that on each continent of this planet there exist already teaching institutes, therapeutic institutes, of logotherapy, in addition scientific societies for logotherapy, and these very societies are issuing, uh, publishing periodically their journals, logotherapy, various languages, and uh, finally uh, they are arranging congresses on logotherapy, not only on a national but even on an international basis, so that so far they have arranged seven world congresses on logotherapy. More than 200 editions of Man's Search for Meaning since the 50s demonstrate the timelessness of this book four million copies of which have been sold in the United States. Viktor Frankl's 27 books have been translated into 22 languages, including Japanese, Chinese, Korean, and Russian. How would you define logotherapy in a nutshell? Uh, the Greek word logos has to be translated by meaning. 
And in fact, logotherapy could be defined as a meaning-centered psychotherapy. Its main concern, however, has to be to help other people, our patients, overcome the psychological reductionism. Reductionism states that everything is really and ultimately nothing but something else. For instance, uh, uh, love is nothing but sublimated sex. Or a human conscience, moral conscience, is nothing but the superego, and the superego in turn is nothing but the interjected father image. Or let me uh, quote Sigmund Freud, who literally once stated that philosophy is nothing but a halfway decent form of sublimating repressed sexuality. Now, if uh, a Californian Freudian, a Californian psychoanalyst, once came up with the statement that the uh, wide, worldwide spread feeling of meaninglessness is nothing but uh, the outgrow of uh, castration fear, then you may easily imagine what the impact of such a statement might be on those of our patients who are suffering from such a feeling of meaninglessness, or better to say, uh, as I'm used to call it, the, their existential vacuum. The existential vacuum thereby is just reinforced rather than overcome. After his rescue from the last concentration camp, he returned to Vienna and settled in an apartment opposite the General Hospital. In the semicircular room, he writes his books, A young artist painted this portrait in 1954. Mrs. Frankel received it as a present for their wedding anniversary. From his desk, you can see the Purgatory Man, a Baroque sculpture. He is surrounded by red painted flames. Frankel refers to him as the Homo Patiens, the suffering human being. This is also the title of one of his books. His library was very modest in the beginning, in 1945, there existed only those quadruple shelves down left. Frankl had other shelves added, and so the library gradually grew to what it looks like today. Being creative in both disciplines, how would you define the difference between scientific and literary writing? It is very difficult to me to formulate scientific texts. And uh, for instance, there is in one of my books included one sentence whose formulation took me exactly three hours. It's different in non or less scientific texts. For instance, the book Man's Search for Meaning, the, including the autobiographical sketch uh, regarding uh, the period of time I had to, sp I had to spend in concentration camps, uh, this book, to write down this book, took me nine days altogether, nine uh, consecutive days. And there is a, a short drama I once wrote down in one sweep within nine uh, consecutive hours only. Incidentally, this drama has been recently staged in the uh, Elysium Theater in New York. This was in, uh, in, context, in the context of my 85th birthday, celebrated by them in this way in March 1990, 1990.
How did you feel about using the German language after the Auschwitz experience? Uh, once I had to give a lecture in Little Rock, in Arkansas, and afterwards, uh, in the context of a reception they gave me, uh, I was asked the question, uh, how is it possible to you uh, to still write your books in German after Hitler? And I reacted by asking that lady, could you kindly show me your kitchen? She brought me to her kitchen. And then I inquired, may I have a look at uh, your knives and uh, your forks and your spoons? And she gladly showed me this material. And then I said, oh my goodness, how is it possible to you still to use knives since you know that so many people have been dying because they had uh, uh, been stabbed by knives. Which poets and authors impressed you most? I've been mostly impressed, not to say influenced, in my whole thinking, uh, by the following orders. Arthur Schnitzler, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, Werfel, and Joseph Roth his novel, Hiob, and the poems written by Christine Lavand. Perhaps one may notice that all these authors and their works are centering, not to say focusing, on the human problems uh, in context with suffering, particularly psychic suffering, not to say psychotic, or at least neurotic suffering, and the question whether there is a meaning that may be squeezed out even from such suffering. And this, exactly this, is after all the theme of my own works. Now at least regarding the works of the uh, people, the authors, that I have enumerated right now, one may say what has been said by a Spanish proverb. La hora pasa, la pena se olvida, la obra queda. Or to put it in English, the time is passing the suffering is forgotten. However, the work remains. <laughs>